Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. We're back here for another Thursday. It's 8.30 p.m. Toronto time. Hello, wherever you are and whenever you're listening to this. My name's Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. And as with every week, it is such a privilege and an honor for me to be here. I am so excited to hear from and chat with our guests tonight. Uh, I love all of the martial artists we get to talk to. I love all of you listening. But I have a special affinity for those who've really put the rubber uh, to the road in the ring. And I can't wait to hear uh, the philosophies and, and the, the training and everything involved with the, the career that our guest tonight has had. Uh, every week it falls to me, uh, the great honor to introduce Sensei Nicholas Suino, uh, who's one of our hosts. He was our first guest. It went so rockingly well. We said, would you do us the honor of becoming a co-host with us? And that sort of set all of this in motion. And, uh, you know, each week I give his palmaris. He's a... He's an eighth dan in Iaido, a sixth dan in Jiu-Jitsu, a sixth dan in Judo. And I just say it real quick, but we can never gloss over what those numbers actually mean when we think about the fact that this man has been training, if I'm not mistaken, he can correct me, for 53 years and is still doing it and still goes to and comes from that dojo when he's doing this show with us. But one other thing I want to mention, you know, I was looking uh, at new stuff to talk about and you know, he has this idea of finding your life's purpose. And I, I just looked at the first one that he put on his website, which is he realized that he functions more from a place of passion than logic. Um, what I just want to say about Sensei Nicholas Suino is that he's also an excellently logical man. And I want to throw this to you, Sensei, with the idea that I love the idea that you recognize that passion's your superlative. But when I speak to you, whatever work you've done around that, you've actually made logic an equal strength. How are you doing tonight? And what do you think of that idea? Well, I think you need both, right? The head and the heart. Mm. And uh, at least in my experience, life functions better when you have both. I know I've struggled to balance both well. But thank you for that lovely introduction. You know, uh, my arthritis knows <laughs> that I've been doing martial arts for 53 years, and I'm sure the champ can attest to something similar. Uh, thank you so much, Sean, the the, the uh, uh honor and privilege of being introduced by you at, on, in these shows is, is literally life-changing and I really truly appreciate it. Thanks, it sir. falls You're to welcome. me each and every week to introduce Sensei Randy Dauphin, who many of you on this call know, um, some better than others. So Sensei Dauphin has uh, very high ranks in the martial arts. I know he's a seventh down in karate, third down in Iaido, and um, first down in the, in the all- Canada Kendo Federation, Seite EI. Um, but he's so much more than that. He's a successful fighter, competitor, um, a great martial arts teacher, a great parent. I know and love his children. Um, and he and I have spent hours together in the dojo and in the gym on the running trail, um, talking over beers. And one of my, I have two, I have this wonderful pair of memories with, with Randy. Um, one is when he came to our town uh, to uh, attend a seminar by a French Shotokan master. And it was an amazing seminar, um, but we got to do, I guess what I call light sparring or high speed uh, 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 contact drills. And I remember how overwhelming it was, how fast he moved and how inefficient I felt. But I have to say, even though it was a it was a, a very fast paced and an intense encounter, I never felt a, a in, in real danger. So that's a really cool feeling. And then the the pair of experiences is that at one point he came to one of my events called the Crucible, which is a twelve hour immersive training event. And the very end of the time, uh, we were doing a grappling component, and Randy and I grappled together. And he went from being a and Sean, you were at that event too. Um, uh, Randy went from being essentially not a grappler to somebody I probably would have happily given uh, uh, a first level brown belt to, uh, you know, after 12 hours because of the intensity of the experience. But I remember grappling with Randy and um, feeling how far he had come, but recognizing, right, that I've been doing grappling since I was eight years old um, and feeling very comfortable myself. And it was just a neat pair of experiences in some proximity to be able to see how adept he was at at uh, striking and recognizing that level of expertise. So that was really cool. Randy, uh, having said all that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Sensei. Yeah, and I can tell you that uh, I think I might have you by a pound or two, not too many, but by a pound or two. And if you've never grappled with Sensei Suino, you know, I can tell you, you might as well have a Mack truck parked on your chest if you're rolling around with this guy and he gets on top of you. 
good luck getting them off. That's all I can say to you. Um, and so thanks for that, uh, that intro. I always, every week, I get to say a couple of things about Hanshi Legacy and introduce um, our guest of honor. And I say many of the same things every week about Hanshi Legacy because you never know when somebody looks on YouTube if they're going to just watch one show or so. You know, we need to say that uh, for sure, Hanshi Legacy is the 10th then, and he was awarded that 10th then by his teacher, Anthony Sandoval. He is a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. He's an author this year, so this is his book, and we can get that to you if you're interested in it. And um, he's been a student of Harold Warden, Benny Allen, Richard Kim, and his current sensei, who is uh, Anthony Sandoval. So tonight, uh, oh, it, this is another interesting thing. Last time I was with him, I said, you know, Hanchi, you finally beat out my dad. So... Uh, literally, Hanchi Legacy has known me longer than my father has known me now. So he has more years with me than my dad had with me. So that's, that's something that's very interesting. And when I said that to him, he said, that's good. And my mom's no longer with us. And he, since he's still here, he said, I'm coming for your mom. Right? <laughs> like, so, so his goal is he's going to get more years in with, than my mom too. So, and I got to say, I feel pretty good about that. That's not a bad thing to hear somebody say about you. Uh, tonight, I shot out a message to all of my students, and I said, "If you had to describe Hanchi Legacy in one word, what word would you uh, what word would you use?" And this is the collection of words that came back: experienced, wise, collected, intense, deep, fierce, explosive, revolutionary, sensitive, passionate, honorable, teacher, bushi, leader, and then. I'll just mention, because it's his goddaughter, my, my daughter sent in a guardian that she, she sees you as a guardian. And she also said loving, she sent in two words. So for me, I could probably come up with a different word every day if you asked me. But the one that I thought of today was uh, obsessed. Like he's an obsessive person. Mm. I mean, he's very obsessive about his martial arts and he has been for 50 years now, he's been very obsessive about training and teaching and spreading the word about martial arts. And I think to become successful, you have to be somewhat obsessive. You, you have to be totally obsessive about, and driven about what you're trying to do. And I can honestly say he's been obsessive and driven in an active way. Lots of people at some point, you know, they strap the uniform on, but they're not really doing it anymore. That's not the case with Hanshi Legacy. And I want everybody to know that if you want to train with him, you're, it's going to be an active training session, not a theoretical training session. Um, so that's my, those are my facts tonight about Hanchi Legacy, and I'm really happy to be able to say those things. But now, uh, it's my job to introduce the champ, Daryl Hennigan, and I'm super excited to, to introduce him tonight. Um, I've known about him for a long time because uh, I've been a big fight fan. Uh, he started Taekwondo in 1974. Um, and he's trained under Grandmaster Chong Su Lee in Quebec, Canada. Uh, he received his black belt in 1978 um, under the direct tutelage of Grandmaster Lee, who also graded him to his seventh then. And right now he's currently an eighth degree black belt. Uh, in 1981, he won the World Taekwondo Games and was North America's first Taekwondo World Champion title holder. And he's one of the first guys to actually go to Korea and beat them up at their at their art, which is also pretty cool, I think. Go Canada, go. Um, <laughs> as a full contact fighter, um, his kickboxing honors include 15 times world champion, uh, heavyweight champion. And as a heav heavyweight, he's, he's triumphed over such opponents as Andre Banish, Curtis Cowboy Crandall, and Lowell Flash Nash. Uh, in 2016, he received the Joe Lewis Eternal Warrior uh, Memorial Award. Uh, and he's joining the ranks of people like Bill Superfoot Wallace, who have also won that award. Um, he's uh, currently a member of Hanchitarian's World Kabuto Federation. He's proud of that. He mentions that often, which is nice. And he's a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame, like Hanchi Legacy. Uh, and that's actually the first time I got to, to meet uh, the champ. And as soon as I saw him, I knew it was him. And he probably doesn't remember because lots of people were walking up and shaking his hand, but I was happy to be able to walk up and shake his hand. And as I walked away, I realized how small my hand was compared <laughs> to his hand. <laughs> um, the that. one thing I want to say about the champ is 
if you've ever fought before and you walk in a room with other fighters, you know the pecking order really quick. They have that thing about them, right? Like they just have that way they move. It's kind of sense of legacy says it's like mercury. You can't put your finger on it. You just know, right? You just know. Um, and one of my students once said, that's that feeling of having like a secret identity, right? You have like the secret identity. People don't really know, but you know, and the other people who know, know, right? Um, one of the things I really liked uh, when I, we talked recently, um, he said, I consider myself to be a traditionalist, right? He considers himself to, despite all the sporting that he did, he, he considers himself to be a traditionalist, which I really like and I respect that. Um, and one thing I know is if you watch him fight, even as a traditionalist, the champ knows what works and what doesn't work. You can see it. He knows, <laughs> he knows what to leave aside and what to bring into the ring with him. Uh, and if you don't believe me, watch his fight with James Mad Dog Downey, and then you're going to see how he knows what he's doing when he gets in there. Um, I got to just talk a little bit about his fighting prowess. And this is just my opinion. Again, I have opinions. Um, so good with his legs and his hands. Just so good at, at uh, mixing it up. Great distancing, really good uh, ring control and very smooth at mixing things up. And one of the things that I really like, Champ, how you, you mix up the power. You don't just bring the hammer every single time with every kick and every punch. Sometimes it's just a couple of touches and you can see the person thinking, oh, he just touched me a couple of times. And then the next thing, their head's being snapped back like a Pez dispenser. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and if I, the last thing I want to say about the Champ before we get going here about his fighting is, uh, we said this before, if, if you want to ever see somebody get roundhouse kicked in the head, you should watch him when he fights shoot. You can go on YouTube and watch it. I mean, it's the ultimate roundhouse kick on the planet when you watch it. Um, he for sure is one of Canada's best all-time contact fighters and probably globally as well, in my opinion. And I'm super excited to learn more about him and get to know him better. And also super grateful that he'd come on and chat with us tonight. So thanks so much, champ. Um, just going to turn it back to Sean for a minute, and then we're going to get rolling here. Thanks, Sensei. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that intro. Champ, I'll be just a sec. I just want to talk to our audience. So everybody watching, uh, as with every week, we have the chat button at the bottom of the screen, and we really welcome and want your questions. Uh, the fact that you're listening in real time, you get to be a part of the living history we're creating in real time. And the people who watch later or listen later don't get to do that. So we invite your input and your questions. And then uh, as far as what's happening tonight, if you're new to this, Punch, Kick, Choke Chat is the five gentlemen you see on the screen shooting the shit. We're adult. And uh, if you don't like anything we say, you can take it up with your own higher power because we don't care, love. We don't care. We don't give a creep. So uh, we're going to move on then. Uh, the next thing, and actually I had a great time doing this last week with Sensei Dauphin, and I'm going to uh, do it tonight for the first time of three. Hi, this is Don Warner from warnerentertainment.com, W-A-R-R-E-N-E-R.com. And we're proud to be one of the sponsors of Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. We encourage you to visit our website at warnerentertainment.com and get your free copy of Warriors Magazine today. Over 2,500 items, including books, DVDs, downloads, rare posters, lots more featuring some of the biggest names in martial arts. Shotokan's Hirokazu Kanazawa, Goju Ryu's Chuck Merriman, Ninja Stephen Hayes, legendary Joe Lewis, and that's just the beginning. WarnerEntertainment.com, W-A-R-R-E-N-E-R -E -E Entertainment.com. And we're going to do this two more times tonight. Yeah, I want to just say quick, Sean, yeah. that uh, I'm grateful that, uh, that Mr. Warner would help us in this way, that it's a very symbiotic relationship. And the main thing that I really like about it is it shines a light on the people that we're interviewing and their history kind of lives on because when people go to that magazine, if they see it, then it bounces them back. They see the tape of uh, the champ and they'll get to learn some good things about him. So it's really a beneficial thing that we're doing together. I love that. And one thing I just want to add to that and throw it again to the audience, thank you. Because the only reason why people would want to get and be like, hey, how about you guys do this? And I'll put an ad is because of you, the audience. You're tuning in every week. You're promoting the show. You're posting about it on Facebook. It's getting some heat. And we like that uh, because we get to keep doing it. It makes it worthwhile. We'd probably do it anyways, but thank you. Um, let's get into the interview now. Um, Champ, first off, I just want to start by saying something we talked about before. 
uh, there's a site on Twitter called Room Raider. And the, the site blew up because they go through the Zoom things that people post and rate rooms. And I tell you, yours is a 15 out of 10. This is, and no disrespect to any of our other guests, this is the best room anyone's ever showed up to an interview with. And you, you and your wife set that up before the interview? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, I have to give the credit to my wife. Uh, you know, she, um, she really handled everything uh, and uh, did a really great job. But before we go on, I'd just like to, um, you know, really show, uh, I really enjoyed that uh, introduction. It was awesome, Randy, thank you very much. Um, I really, when I saw the, um, I think it was around Christmas time, they were um, on Facebook, they were mentioning, you know, um, that, that this, um, that your organization was doing this. And I, I was, I'm really honored and touched to be, a, to be a part of it. I really wanted to be, and I was, I was really uh, honored that you had uh, reached out and uh, I quickly accepted to, uh, to be on your show. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, inviting me onto the show. And uh, uh, it's, The pleasure's all it, ours. It really is. And I think you'll find that, yeah, the, the, it really is our honor and, and we get to chat with you about it. And, you know, I, I, I did my homework on you this week as I do with most of our guests and, and I hadn't known of your fighting before. And I, like I want your shin bronzed and sent to me because that roundhouse kick is, is it's insane. And we'll, we'll get to that, but let's get back to the beginning for you. Let's get back to where you were born, where you grew up and what brought you into that first Taekwondo dojo. Sure. I, um, I was born in Queens, New York and uh, with a, a brother and sister of mine. Uh, we, um, we lived in uh, um, with my grandmother for um, uh, the first part of our life when my uh, mom came uh, to Mon Montreal and settled. My mom is a pretty uh, famous uh, jazz uh, vocalist, Renee Lee. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when she was settled in, she, uh, she brought my uh, brother and sister and I uh, to Montreal. And uh, so that was in around, that was in 1972. So that time, you know, you had pretty much uh, the first generations, you know, starting in martial arts, organized martial arts, where you had schools and you had, uh, you know, different um, arts uh, starting to um, make names and, uh, you know, um, uh, establishing themselves in the, uh, in the genre. And uh, of course you had the, you know, the martial arts movies and the Bruce Lee movies. And uh, that was really, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a usual thing it was an uh, un unusual thing and that was a ex you know every as a kid everybody you know wants to pretend that they can kick you, you saw wrestling i wanted to do the same thing you know that yeah. all this and uh, it was it was a uh, you know exciting time i'm 12, 11 12 years old and um, i wanted to start uh, doing some martial arts so i actually started with shotokan karate at uh, the YMCA in, uh, down in um, Montreal uh, West. And, um, and um, I moved, my brother was doing, uh, was doing judo. And uh, my brother and I have a little history of always fighting, like I guess most young brothers do, lion cubs. <laughs> and, uh, he, you know, uh, when I was young, I used to, I, I had split my nose. So he's always hit me in the nose and I bleed and then the fight's over. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he he was taking judo at the time and um, Shotokan was was a is a great art and uh, but I moved on to doing judo with him and uh, at the same place at the YMCA and uh, I was starting to get pretty good you know even at that that young age and, uh, I think I went to a green belt and, uh, and I remember he had this big. Uh, I guess Japanese, you know, teacher, and uh, you know, I, you know, we were starting. I was starting to get fond of him, and I was really, really getting into it. And um, a friend of mine was doing taekwondo at the time at another place, not too far. So he'd go to taekwondo. I'd come to Hawaii and do my thing, but I'd go back up, wait for him at his school, and then we'd go home together. And um, I was a you know, a fresh kid from New York and everything to me was funny. You know, I just had these big cheeks and the, 
I wasn't serious about anything. And it was just, you know, again, 11, 12 years old. And his teacher, I mean, I'd go in and his teacher would let me watch. And of course my friend was there and I wasn't very impressed. His teacher was very good because he was flexible. He, he was doing the splits and he was doing all these, uh, you know, uh, nice kicks. And, but the, I wasn't impressed with the, let's say the, um, you know, the uh, structure or the organization of it, you know, the school setting part. And uh, I didn't find value because I didn't understand what was going on. So uh, at that point, and I'd make fun. And, and then subsequently, the uh, school changed, uh, I guess, owners. And my teacher, which is, his name was uh, uh, Ray Nickel. He's one of the first generation Taekwondo under Grandmaster V. And uh, he, he came into the school. And so where the other teacher who didn't mind, he'd always kick me out. <laughs> you know, uh, I wasn't quiet, so he'd, he'd kick me out. And uh, it was like these long flight of stairs and I'd have to wait for my friend at the bottom of the stairs. So one, uh, one day, I guess, and I kept coming, he, um, he, there was a, uh, he invited me to go see a, um, a Taekwondo demonstration that they were having at one of the malls downtown. And uh, and again, you remember the times of the time is Bruce Lee movies. And the, so the Taekwondo demonstration was, you know, nunchucks and swords and jumping, flying kicks and kicking apples off the sword. And, you know, they're, you know, spinning kicks. And uh, so I was, I was really captured at that time. That's what I, I said, okay, I want to do that, you know. And, uh, and then I went back to the school and over time he, um, he, uh, you know, invited me to start training, and uh, I took to it really, uh, really quickly. And um, and uh, it, it's kind of one of these stories where, you know, I never, I never paid, you know, as like a normal kid going to a school, I never paid to do taekwondo. I, I would, I, he gave me a uniform. The only, he only said to me was, uh, you know, I want you to, I want you to train, you know, every day. And I want you to do what I tell you to do, mm. and and compete. And I would that was all I wanted to do at that time after after learning how to to move, and um, and uh, once I started getting good and we started, uh, you know, move. I started moving up in my belts, my ranking. He, uh, you know, he he took he sat me down. I remember the day because it was like one of these days where you're sitting in the office and. The, the sun is coming through the through the cur to the window, big window, and uh, it was one of those serious moments. And he said, "You know, I'm going to make you the first world champion in Taekwondo." Ooh, what, so are you like 15, 16 around this time? Uh, I'm about. I was a brown belt, so I'm about 17 at this okay. time. Okay. And um, and uh, but I'm really becoming prime. Uh, and you got to remember, you had guys like. <laughs> Mike Warren, Albert Cheeks, uh, Jerry Robbins, you know, these are like legendary guys in uh, Taekwondo from that generation. And these guys were, you know, along of course with uh, Daniel Riche and, uh, and our fighters that we had here, you know, and a lot of them, you know, were these flash fighters too, very good and very, uh, very dynamic fighters and very tough, even if they weren't like John Picard was a heavyweight at the time. And, uh, he was, you know, the first heavyweight, the first champion, and, and um, he was a, um, you know, they were forces to be reckoned with in the martial arts time. And, um, you know, uh, for me, though, it was a question of, uh, I never got to meet him in competition, and uh, he retired when I kind of broke through. And uh, when I, uh, in order to, you know, every, generation has a has more than not an opportunity to fight the past champions mm -hmm. of that generation and that's sort of their passing of the torch if they beat them and if they don't well that makes their job a little bit harder and my passing of the torch was beating a um, jerry, jerry robbins from the u.s and uh who's today is the uh, president of the uh the um world uh, taekwondo uh, hall of fame and, and was that uh, before or after he had that combo with you about being that champ? Was that around that time? No, he, uh, you mean that he became uh, president of the- No, that you beat him. How was he? 
sorry. Were you fighting at that level with those people at that brown belt level? Is that when? No. So I, I passed black belt mm -hmm. and uh, I passed black belt. And I think this was, I think it was in 19, 1979 or 78, 80. And uh, I was really, you know, young. I had these Elvis Presley sideburns <laughs> or Jim <laughs> Kelly. And I liked, I was yeah. a fan of Elvis Presley. So, you know, Jim Kelly, you know, mm -hmm. maybe both, little boat. And, uh, and, you know, we were fighting and uh, I was reminded that it was at Hosford University. And, um, you know, he had knocked out, you know, every opponent that he faced before me. And uh, I think I knocked out one. And, uh, and I had this big, uh, you know, you know, you know that the, the, the uh, callus on the toes when it splits. So I had this big one on the big toe and it tore right off. And you could see the meat of the, of the, of the underneath the toe. So his teacher came to my teacher while we were there, and he said, "Oh, that that looks really bad. He, I don't think he's gonna be able to fight." So that right? My teacher, yeah, my teacher. <laughs> that right? <laughs> uh, I don't know what it was, but it just set him off. And uh, he said, "Not only he's gonna fight, but he's gonna win." And then he took off. He said, "Left me standing there, you know. And I don't know what happened, where he went. He came back. He goes." I just saw Jerry Robbins in the in the in the locker room. He's got a stomach like this. He's like he's got two rolls under his stomach. If you let him win, you don't deserve to fight. You don't deserve mm. to be champion. And that's what I remember. And I, that was a blank after that. All I know is I wiped him, and mm. uh, the rest uh, became history after that. Yeah, with your sore toe and all, with your sore with toe. Sore yeah, toe. <laughs> I guess it didn't slow you down too much, champ. <laughs> So it, it, it really goes to show a lot of, you know, how important or how, you know, um, um, I want to say inspirational, but I want to use another word, you know, how um, you know, inspiring, I guess, uh, a coach can be mm. because they really can bring out the best in you as a fighter and the best in you as a competitor. And uh, very good coaches know how to tap into that, uh, you know, that res reservoir of talent. And uh, he was an excellent, an excellent coach and an excellent mentor and friend. And uh, you know, you know, we. It was another story too, where, you know, not everybody believed in me as much as he did, and uh, it came to a point where. Uh, um, some people thought because of that, my friend who I initially went to train with, and this is before we passed black belt, uh, was this flexible guy and he could do this. And, and it's, it's, it's almost like I, I lived this actual movie where, you know, the first in the gym, the hardest to train and the last mm. to be, I was that guy. I didn't do anything else other than, I mean, I did, but it just seemed like that's all I did was eat, sleep and, you know, Dream Taekwondo, ask me, what are you doing? Fighting. Mm. <laughs> Every time of the day, what are you doing? Fighting. Mm. Just fighting in my head. And uh, and uh, they at that time, Master Lee was having a tournament and we were brown belts at that time. We had never fought uh, junior. We always fought senior. And um, so we, you know, fought, fighting uh, junior at his tournament. And uh, he was, my my instructor Ray was, you know, pretty, pretty, um, you know, diplomatic. He said, "Okay, no problem." Needless to say, we didn't fight anybody because they all threw the towel in, and we ended up meeting each other at the, for the finals. And uh, and then before this, I didn't know, but before this, you know, you know, some people thought that my friend actually was going to be, you know, a top fighter and, uh, you know, the a world champion. And my instructor said, no, it's going to be Daryl. And uh, that tournament, again, you know, we were brought up to fight, and that's what we did. We fought, and uh, I was uh, very successful with that fight. He quit uh, Taekwondo after that, and I went on to uh, the rest of my history. So Jim, I want to ask you a question about that mindset, about the willingness to be the first guy in, the last guy out. And, you know, maybe this has nothing to do with it, but do you think you're in New York and your mom goes obviously to pursue a dream in another country right. and then brings you there once she gets settled and is successful. Right. Do you think having that role model 
of someone who's willing to put even her family on the line for that which matters most is something that stuck with you? Do you think that shaped your willingness to train that way? Or, or, or was there a sense of how dare she do that to me and I'm working the bag with, with that feeling? Do you think that's part of it? Um, I know that um, for sure uh, it's um, one of the things that I, um, I, um, I pride myself on in that, you know, her dedication to her family, you know, people might think of it as she left us but she really opened up a real future and gave us a chance at a future more than actually leave us. And the sacrifice for her to have to leave us, she left us in you know, really great hands. She left us with, with my grandmother who really nurtured us and took care of us. And uh, you know, um, it wasn't like she abandoned us. She really, she really left us in capable hands. And uh, she, she not only went on to you know, and she's still alive today, you know, pursue her career, but to give us a, a future, and my brother and sister and I. And I mean, you know, for sure being a child and growing up, you think like a child. So, you know, you you think that, oh, how mom, how could mom do that? And, you know, and uh, you, feel, you feel, you know, the uh, anxiety of that. But as you get older and you, you know, realize life and experience life, you, uh, you can understand and appreciate the value of what she did and went through to, to make our lives better. And, uh, you know, I liken it to, you know, again, when you're a child, you think like a child. And when you're an adult, you think like a man. So I, it made me realize that uh, she was quite a special woman to be so strong to do that. And of course that probably, you know, um, you know, definitely played a role in, you know, in hindsight, you know, of, uh, I guess my perseverance to want to be something, but I think, I think I was, I'm a driven, I was a driven soul anyways. I mean, I really wanted to accomplish things. And I think, you know, like we were saying, I was saying earlier, the mentorship between a, you know, a, a teacher and a pupil is, uh, is you know extremely the you know the the, the relationship is stream, extremely strong and influential in you know how a young and, and you know impressionable on a young young man young child I was you know 11 12 13 years old when I started taekwondo and you know to have somebody believe in you at that time uh, to be able to do something and again in martial arts at that time it's very rough. It wasn't quite, you know, I mean, as finesse as it is now, it was very, you know, first generation martial artists are, uh, you know, it's the true grit of, Montreal, of martial mm. arts. You know, they're really the backbone and, you know, the foundation of what martial arts in any martial art, in my opinion, is founded on is the, uh, you know, the first generations of that because they set the precedence of what you know martial arts should be like you know and um, as a martial arts if, you, if you're talking about a sport and if you're talking about a recreation you know those have their uh, definition but as a true martial artist i i we believe the a credo that they really laid out and i felt that uh, as, a, as a martial artist and as a traditionalist that's what uh, i really prided myself on the following i just feel that you know I don't, I don't have to, even though I have this rank and I have this, uh, you know, credibility, um, it's just for me, if there's a difference, I, I like to maintain that I am just a, you know, a normal person and uh, I, don't, I don't wear that, you know, that's who I am and that's what I've accomplished and achieved and, and that's great, but at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a normal human being and I, I respect everyone and I, expect to be respected that might be something like that thing about when you walk into a room and mm -hmm. everybody comes to you. you know it, it's not a it's not something that you put on it's something that you are and it's something that you believe so that you don't have to become that person you already are that person yeah. That's I, what wish, I, I wish more people felt like that champ you know that they want to give respect and they expect to be respected because i I feel like that maybe sometimes is going away. I feel it here when I come in here with people and I feel it with you and I feel it 
on this call, but sometimes when you're in the grocery store, you just don't feel that as much. Um, people seem to be after their own thing and getting what at the expense of somebody else instead of respecting that other person. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's an example. You know, the first thing is, is we set an example. We set an example of who we are and how we want to be treated by the way we treat other people. You know, it, it's one thing, fine, I'm this guy and I'm this, this fighter and uh, I've accomplished these things. Most people don't know that. But what you alluded to earlier is you walk with a certain confidence, you walk with a certain gait, you walk with a certain assurance that, you know, you're this person. But I also walk with the integrity and, and respect for humans and people, you know, and I don't, I don't misuse that gift or that talent. And by my example, that's how I treat people. That's how I want to be treated. So in the, you know, in the same thing, you know, you can have, you know, any instance, you go into the store and uh, you hold the door open for the, the next person that's coming in. That's an example. You may not think it, but many of people just saw you hold the door mm -hmm. for that person. Somebody's going by, you let them go by before you. You know, you, you show courtesy, you show, you know, you show your respect. Uh, you don't, you don't, you know, demand it. You show what you believe that, you know, others should to show to you. And um, I think, you know, in, in some respects, you know, you know, maybe that, that, that could be the case. You know, I, I, I don't want to diminish the people that really don't act like that. And the people that do do the, you know, their part in making, uh, in a better society and better place to live in. And it's up to all of us to show, set an example how uh, the ones that are not doing it should really, uh, should really look forward to doing it, look up to doing it. Champ, I took something from what Sensei pointed out and what you said, and I wrote it down is you expect respect. And I think that's so much of the key is that I think when we know we're worth respect, we actually behave more humbly. And when we don't know we're worth respect, we seek an outward version of respect in a way that doesn't have a depth to it or a truth to it. And so it's hard to be the change when you don't trust, like, am I worth respect? And when you say that, I expect respect. I just wrote that down, like, I'm gonna practice that, like practice owning that I expect to be well treated by treating others well. You know, another interesting thing about that is on the outside, fear and respect look the same. Cool. Like if you try and go around and make people be afraid of you, it can be perceived as respect, but it's actually not. It's and, and it's actually, you know, it's actually, you know, noticeable. You know, per, people will have a first impression of me or, you know, of anyone until you say something, you know, until you act a certain way. And then they'll become, oh, he's not at all what I expected him to be. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it will <laughs> change their perspective on, who they thought and what they thought of me at that time, that time. But their first impression is that, you know, um, oh, that guy looks tough, don't mess with him. But I don't walk around saying, I'm tough, don't mess with me. You know, I'm a normal person, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I like to, I like to, you know, again, you know, um, exhibit that and be that. The other thing is, you know, it's not something that you turn on and off, that's who you are. And if, if, if it's a question of, you know, I always tell my, my kids and I always taught my students the, the same thing. You know, be the person that you want to be, not just sometimes, but all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you're that sometime guy, hey, ask that guy to do that. Well, no, he only does it sometimes. Ask that guy, no, he's not reliable. Ask that guy, oh, he's, he's solid. He's going he's gonna to do what he says he's going to do. Well, then you have to be that person all the time or at least more times than you're not. And then all of you, you know, your character is then assumed that, you know, you're this guy and you know how to react when you're in those, uh, those situations in life that ask you to, uh, you know, stand up. This is why I, I, I love this show because the way you punch and kick got you on our show. And now what we're talking about is so much more important to me than the punches and kicks. But let's get back to that because, um, so I'm going to link a few ideas here with this question, and then um, I hope it's not too convoluted, but you call yourself a traditionalist, even though in the sporting arena, you've been this 15-time world champ. So my first question is kind of why? And secondly, like Joe Rogan talks about this kind of idea, like 
there's there's almost two kinds of Taekwondo. There's the more point um, based, and then there's the type you do, where obviously he's got those kicks as well. Like, wh okay. where does that traditional TKD live, and how has it gotten diluted by what would be considered more of a sport version? Because that's not really what you're doing, even when you're in the ring kickboxing. That's a martial art you're doing. Right. That's not a sport. No, I mean, again, it's it's the foundation of where I come from. So the generations or the generation before, and then my interpretation of that generation handed down to the, the next generation and there and subsequently those after. I mean, um, I, I think it's really embedded in, you know, um, what we came from, you know, again, like I said, the, the pioneers of martial arts, the first generation of martial arts, you know, they're the, uh, you know, they're the, the true grit of the sport or, or of the martial art. And, you know, it just, be, it just became something we believed. Mm. You know, it wasn't really something that you practiced. It was, you know, and, and of course with Grandmaster Lee, it was his teaching that was, you know, you know, you assimilated really our character or my character in that I, um, you know, I learned how to be modest. I learned how to be respectful. I learned how to be, you know, um, have integrity. And I trusted the word, I trusted the meaning, the definition of those words. And, uh, and I've trusted them, you know, in my life. And it, martial arts doesn't only just tell you those things. They kind of, for me, in the competing wise, prove those things. Mm. In competition, you know, I've been to, you know, hundreds of competitions. I've trained thousands of hours to compete. And you don't just train to kick and punch. You, you train to live the experience that you're going through and live that life that you're going through. And it becomes your life, like I said about the kids and, you know, be that person. And if you, and if you commit to it and do it enough, well, then that's something that in, becomes inherent with you through the rest of your life and the rest of your career. And my career just transcended from Taekwondo traditional uh, competitions and WTF full contact Taekwondo and then to kickboxing. And kickboxing just for me seemed to be, uh, or full contact seemed to be the, you know, um, the next progression of fighting that, um, you know, I could still you know, implement the, uh, you know, the, the, the style of kicking that I have and the fighting that I have, the, the intuition of fighting that I have, and then learn a new system of fighting. Mm -hmm. And that's how I look at it as a, as a system. I look at kickboxing as, you know, like MMA today or UFC today, or, or any martial arts, they're really rooted in systems. This is the system of this movement, the system of this, you know, uh, execution of movement, and you know the discipline that's involved behind that. So I looked at kickboxing as a way to, uh, you know, extend my career in uh, in fighting, and um, and uh, I was successful at it. You know, awesome. I think I think as far as the traditional part, I think it's it's more in the uh, I want to say nostalgia, but it's more in the you know what what you believed in at the time and what you were taught in at the time and what transcends to today, which you don't necessarily see in like a sport, a sport uh, dojoing or dojo as you call it, uh, atmosphere. And when I grew up, it was more like a, it was like, a, again, it's kind of like the movies, you go into the temple and you're, you go into the school and you learn and you have friendships and you have, you know, it's a hierarchy and you have, uh, you know um, the real the real life version of those of those uh, movies that you see. You know you living them, and now you are a character in that movie. And you know, and it just that uh, happened that you know I was at the you know one one place in the class, and you know the rest of the class was was in another place. And uh, and uh, you had you met you know I, I I it's a brotherhood, and I think the you know. Today it's quite different than it was. There's some there's some um, aspects of today that I really uh, I really appreciate 
especially in, in let's say the karate, karate arts where um, they really uh, immortalize their past. You know, they, 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 they bring them to their present and they always, you know, they're not afraid to, you know, make their past a part of their, of their present. Mm -hmm. Where I find that, um, you know, in, in some ways, you know, um, um, Taekwondo can be sometimes, um, you know, forgetful about their past. Mm -hmm. And um, I really admire that coming into uh, being a part of the uh, World Kabuto Federation and meeting, you know, you know, people and, uh, and appreciating, you know, their commitments to the martial arts. So, you know, when we were growing up, martial arts, martial artists didn't like each other. <laughs> no one liked karate, no one liked taekwondo, no one liked people, no one liked, everybody hated each other, you know, it's like, because everybody thought, you know, they were better than them and their system was better than this and, you know, and, you know, that, that goes to do what your Randy is saying, you know, that's a bit of immaturity. The immaturity part is that you don't, you don't have to, you know, uh, degrade somebody else to appreciate what you're you know, you offer to the martial arts world. The martial arts world isn't just one style. The martial arts, we're, we're a family mm -hmm. and we, we contribute to this family in each of our own disciplines and, and perspective. And that's what makes it a, a martial arts. And that's what makes us brothers and sisters. Sensei, and, I want to throw this to you. I see you nodding along and I see you really, really yeah, taking I, this in. I love this. Uh, I, yeah, I, I always write these notes, uh, Champ, and I've already written like two pages of notes so we might have to stop the conversation early so that i could spend a half an hour telling what you said to us but i'm just kidding about that but we do have uh some longtime supporters of this show some high-ranking people who are uh, fans and names that you would know and one of them one of our most favorite people definitely one of my most favorite people on the planet is uh, sensei conroy copeland and he sent a question in and his question is more around the, your competitive philosophies. And obviously, physically, you are very, very dominant. Like, like we said, both hands and feet, great. Um, but Sensei Copeland's question is more around the, the mental side of it. And did you have any strategies when either in kickboxing or taekwondo, like mental strategies that you tried to use to gain an advantage against any of your opponents? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would look at it as in a sense where um, the mental aspect of it, I, I, I'll put it in, in a couple of perspectives. I, I looked at it more of a, of a spiritual aspect of it. So I looked at it more on along the lines of, um, again, in the teaching. I mean, this, this can be my, my contribution or my, in, my take on the philosophy of the things that we're you know, learning as martial artists. And, you know, things when I, when we, I started doing Taekwondo started to make sense to me. There was almost this logic for me, you know, it created this balance between, you know, what you could do with your body and uh, what made sense. All of a sudden, you know, things started to make sense and, you know, you could, you could put things together or rationalize things um, better because you're able to, you know, uh, transfer your form your body and allow yourself to do or be able to do all these these fantastic things and um i think you know the competitive aspect of the mind part is is in the, the training i mean uh you know when you when i say last uh, first in the studio in the gym in the dojo dojang uh work the hardest and last well that that work ethic you know sets a mindset to, uh, I believe this. I believe this is going to happen. I trust that this is gonna happen. And at the time, more importantly, the man teaching me believes this too. And he may, he's taught me to believe it through my work ethic. It's not like, you know, you go into the gym and, or the dojo and the jodang and you, you know, your recreational, you know, trainer or you train and uh, you know practice and then you you want to aspire to be uh, you know a national 
you know, international world champion, that's not going to happen. If you don't have the mindset to do that, your mind is not triggered on that. And so my mindset at a very early age was, you know, um, um, to how to become and to become the best fighter that, uh, that I could become and be great at doing it. But there is a, you know, a story to that. Like there was a, I mentioned this, this fighter, a great fighter, one of the best of all time in Taekwondo, Mike Warren, Michael Warren. And uh, he and I, my instructor were friends and they used to talk about this, them all the time and it exalt them. Great as this, great as that, great as this. This is going to mindset, remember. And, but we were always being taught, you know, we, you have this elitist attitude and nobody's better than you and you're gonna train. And, you know, so it was this conflict going on mm. and he came to the dojang and uh, we're gonna, we're doing sparring. And I froze doing sparring. I think I was a blue belt a green belt or a blue belt and I froze during the sparring and then he had left I got so angry with myself but I got angry with them because you guys made this guy up to be this super guy and uh, you know I, I I had no chance against him and you know I, I couldn't do anything and I made a conscious decision from there I'll never listen to any of that kind of talk ever again Wow. Nobody is better. Nobody. Is, everybody is flesh and blood, you know. And that mindset from that lesson, you know, when I met, to, when I went to meet Jerry Robbins, is what made me beat him at the time I did. And that, you know, that I, in my mind, and, and coming to, you know, strategies are a different thing. You know, strategies when you're coming to fight. My my principal idea of strategy would be. I don't really care so much. Like I go to competitions and uh, I would never watch the fights. I would always go and sleep till it was my time to get up and get, get ready to fight. And then I'd go and then I, you know, watch my tree and watch the, you know, the guys, but I really didn't care so much about what they were doing. I always prepared whether in Taekwondo and was prepared in Taekwondo to fight. It didn't matter what type of style of fighting that you, that you did or how you fought, you have to contend with me as a fighter. And you had guys that were much more flexible, you know, faster or, you know, uh, grittier. It, it didn't matter. All that matters was you're not gonna fight me the same way you're gonna fight that guy. And I'm going to beat you at whatever it is that you're gonna be trying to do. And so my mindset to answer that question too is I never really went in with you know, you know, oh, this guy's good at this, this guy's good at that. Guys are good at everything. I hmm. always prepared myself to be able to handle whatever situations came up. And I trained that way. So my the imagination to train and the, you know, the visual process in training was all about how to handle this guy, how to handle that guy. Okay, I'm in trouble. I'm out of trouble. How to put pressure on the guy, you know, how to react. And all of that has to be you know, kind of disguised and I'm not afraid of anybody, which I'm not. And, you know, you have that stone face and that, uh, you know, that demeanor that says, doesn't matter what you're going to do, I'm going to walk through you. Love that. That's badass. It is time, my friends. It is time. I know you've been waiting. This is Don Warner from warnerentertainment.com, W-A-R-R-E-N-E-R. -E -E We're proud to be one of the sponsors of Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. We encourage you to visit our website at warnerentertainment.com and get your free copy of Warriors Magazine today. We have over 2,500 items, including books, DVDs, downloads, rare posters, lots more, featuring some of the biggest names in the martial arts, Shotokans, Hirokazu Kanazawa, Gojiru's Chuck Merriman, Ninja Stephen Hayes, legendary Joe Lewis, and that's just the beginning. By the way, check out the Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat interview with Chuck Merriman on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms. And that's warnerentertainment.com, W-A-R-R-E-N-E-R, entertainment.com. Thanks for listening and keep smiling. Yeah. And also to the, anybody who's watching or if they, they go to, it'd be interesting to hear what they think of our logo. Mm. Go into the magazine, have a look Ooh. at our ad and give us some feedback on what you think of our, our ad and what we could do better or different, or if you love it, just tell us, leave it alone. You guys nailed it. That's awesome. Thanks, that's it. That's a great bit of way to keep that feedback loop going. 
Um, okay, so I want to go back to one idea and throw this to Sensei Suino for a sec, because when well, you talked about, oh yes, yeah, Sensei Dofan. Sensei Legacy, did you have something, Sensei? I saw you raise your hand there. Yeah, I, I uh, did want to ask something. Um, I've written it down here. In my opinion, martial arts is a fighting art, right? And if people are not fighting, um, we could they consider themselves warriors? Because wouldn't that the hard fighting and becoming a hard the fighter and that isn't that what really well doing all the hard work and realization forges the politeness, the kindness, like Muhammad Ali. You never seen a guy, a great fighter like that. He was polite, you know, he was kind, he was to other people and that. So do you believe that a guy who just does, uh, I'm just gonna say this, um, Kata is, uh, will ever become a full martial artist? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, so I, I don't believe that there's really one let's say definition to determine what a real or true martial artist is. I think, I think like all martial arts, it makes up a family. And in that family, there's not just one, you know, uh, or a hand, there's not just one finger, there's 10, 10 fingers. I think martial artists is, is a way of life and not contingent on how good you fight. You know, I think katas or I think weapons, I think, uh, recreational, I think uh, anyone that really uh, takes up martial arts as a, you know, a, a discipline, you know, is entitled to that, you know, that title of martial artist. I think that, you know, obviously people that have, um, you know, tried it and, you know, don't no longer do it. That's, you know, that's their, their contribution. I think you have career martial artists that have done uh, done this all their lives, and uh, I think they deserve to be uh, included in the uh, you know the, the the definition of what's a what's a true martial artist. And I don't think that um, I mean, in my opinion, I don't think that um, I have the right to uh, determine you know in any in anyone else's art or in anyone else's uh, you know uh, philosophy what is a true martial artist. I respect uh, everybody's capabilities and capacity to do martial arts. And I think as long as you can exhibit, uh, you know, the integrity that's behind and within any martial art that you do, uh, you're entitled to that description of what uh, a martial artist should be. Well, for instance, if, well, I'm just gonna exaggerate a bit on that. But it was born out of, the military, military, right? Right. So it had to be for fighting, even in peacetime. Right. Armies practice war, right? So if you have a person who is a great baton twirler, he comes into a ring and spins the, the bow around on his flat hand that has absolutely no martial virtue. And you would you classify that as a martial artist? I would classify him as a baton turner. <laughs> <laughs> but he's... He's you getting, know, he's getting, yeah, he's well, getting. I, I look at it this way, you know, uh, but, you know, this, again, the beginning of something does not necessarily always mean what it transcends into. You know, the beginning of something is what it started and where it's from and what it, uh, you know, uh, the foundation and the basis that it's, it's produced on. And, it's like getting to the, it, it could get to the, you know, the, the point where you'd say, okay, well, one martial art is better than the other. That, and I don't think that that's true. I think that any martial art is good. Every martial art that you, you, you have that, that has the discipline and the, you know, the lineage and the history behind it is a good martial art. You have, you have bad teachers, you know, you have bad masters, you have bad grandmasters, but in it itself, it's there to teach, you know, uh, a way of life. And, and, and today's society, even if it comes from war times or times of learning how to do combat to, to defend ourselves or to defend themselves, you know, um, 
from learning how to use the size in the in the in the, the field to cut down rice and you know and learn how to use these methods of weapons to use in combat you know it's not it's not a part of the necessity of life right now uh, and being a practitioner of it so i don't i don't feel that you know it's my place to say what's a true martial artist or or not i can respect anyone that does martial arts to their capacity but not everybody can be a champion not everybody could be a great fighter and you know that's why you have people that you know take you know 10 15 20 years just to pass a black belt so you know and they don't compete but you know they showed such dedication and such commitment and such you know um, fortitude to continue something that they may not be the best at but they found a, a home and they found a you know a, a kinship to doing martial arts and should they not be entitled to be called martial artists uh, you know you you I think I think everyone that practices martial arts to the best of their ability, within the integrity of their martial arts, um, you know, deserves to be considered a martial artist. At what degree is something else? But uh, mm. I think martial arts is great enough to include, you know, uh, the, the different levels of, uh, you know, the um, of the arts, uh, beside fighting or beside, uh, you know. The, the the more uh, uh, let's say um, dramatic things you know the more uh, uh, exceptional things you know I hope that answered the question <laughs> that was awesome just, that's I just it's nice but to just, sit back and watch and take it all I'm in just, I'm just giving my perspective that I you know I I, I think that where um, you know I'm more inclusive of, you know, the, the greater aspect of what martial arts should and could mean to limit it to just, uh, you know, the aspect of fighting and, and where those, those, you know, attributes, like you said, come from where you, you really forge the, uh, you know, the, um, the ability to uh, have this confidence and through your training and fighting and competing that you actually make it uh, come to life. And, uh, and then that's where you do, you know, like you said, and like we've discussed, you do, you know, walk with this assurance that you you, you can handle yourself and protect yourself and whoever uh, you might need to uh, at, a, at, a, at any given time. Um, but I think that uh, sometimes they're Breton photos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's that, Chip. We got a bunch more questions I want to get to, but before we do, we're going to get to the 10 questions. And I just want to make sure we get through these. And then we're going to come back through some stuff that some people have asked and some ideas I want to expand on. So right. these are 10 questions that you can answer as impulsively as you like um, and expand as you wish. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the most effective. No one gives a shit what my answer is. <laughs> What's the most effective move? Hmm. Um. Don't back, don't go back. Mm. Who's the most influential martial artist in your life? Wow. That's a hard question. Um, because I think, you know, um, I'm the kind of guy that um, I can appreciate martial arts done at, or anything done at its, at, its, at the, at the, um, the height or the, the the highest level of its uh, of its competition competitive nature or its uh, exhibition what it shows and i'm a realist and i take i've taken from you know many fighters because i like i understood what it was that they were doing and i felt that that was and that's how you know i came back to taekwondo i, I started in taekwondo i went to kickboxing and in 11 years of not competing, but fighting in Taekwondo, not competing in Taekwondo, but fighting, I came back to Taekwondo. So I had to learn how to fight all over again. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I watched, I watched films. I didn't really care too much what they were doing, let's say in the local scene. I really took world championship level, uh, US Open level. I took, 
you know, videos and I watched what they were doing. And I learned how to, how to do what they're doing and then what I would need to do to beat them at what mm -hmm. they're doing. And that's what I trained. I trained how to fight in aspects, in ratios, in, in ways that they're not doing and wouldn't ex and anticipate me to do or haven't been being done. So it becomes innovative. It becomes, you know, a challenge to, you know, make them see me in a way where, oh, he came from kickboxing. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't know what the system or the style is to he's back, you know, and in my second year back, I, I, you know, for, I won silver medal at the U S open and I knocked out the guy from Denmark who was one of the rising stars of his time. And I'm not boasting on that fact. It's just, Explain, expressing a fact that I studied what it was and how I needed to fight in order to come back where everybody expected me to be this dominant force and uh, fight like I used to or fight like they see me fighting in kickboxing and it, uh, the, 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 sport, the, the sport has evolved you know two generations or a generation and a half since I, I was there and uh, for me to think like that would be for making the same mistakes as other world champions make when they go and retire and decide to come back mm. you know they don't prepare properly and they try to be this guy who they were when they left you know and time has passed them and the, you know and and the, the system and the, the training and the competing has evolved and if you if you don't recognize that you're going to be doomed to the same fate as them and you're going to lose and then you're going to quit so and who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all and why? Who is it? You know, influential is very difficult because it means different things to different people. And it depends on, you know, um, you know, what, I never really wanted to be like someone else. I could appreciate, you know, from the professional fighting to the, to the art martial artists that are from the kickboxing and taekwondo to uh, you know who was relevant at the time and uh, as opposed to you know you know what stars there were at the time and what they did at the time and i never really looked at anyone i could appreciate what they did and i could admire what they did but i never wanted to be like anyone else i never had a nickname my i've always stressed that that's this is who I am. Mm. And um, I want to be known for who I am and the integrity that I have and the, the style of fighting that I have is not representative of anyone else. So I'm not influenced by them as, a, as, as much to say as I want to be recognized the same way. Uh, but I don't want to be recognized like that guy or like this guy. And I don't think today anybody can compare me to anyone else. They always say, you know, that's Daryl. You know, mm. that's that's the way that that guy fights, and you know he's known for this and he's known for that. And they don't say just like someone else. So I think I think anyone that's been, you know, at the top of their game, whether in taekwondo or kickboxing, and uh, you know I have I have closer uh, reverence, uh, you know, to home like Jean Yves Jean Yves Terrio, who's a very good friend of mine, and you know. It, it again, his 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 demeanor, his class, his his you know his championship quality of what I think is a is a real champion and a real um, you know exhibition of what um, a champion should represent in the ring and outside of the ring. I admire that of, of, about him. I admire you know other fighters and other. Uh, people that I'm very good friends with in, in, in the States and out and, uh, and around Canada and around the world and admiring them, you know, it puts them in a position where, um, you know, I can appreciate their, their contributions to uh, martial arts and, and to, uh, you know, um, you know, um, to life, I guess, but um, I don't really find that, I really wanted to pattern myself after anyone. So I, I can appreciate them, but we're at, at the same time, I, um, I really um, wanted and stressed in my life to be Daryl. So 
What excites you most about the next five years of your training? Sorry? What excites you most about the next five years of your training? Not being old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, would it, I mean, I, you know, like, um, as, as I've gotten older, you know, uh, I, I hadn't like in my, in my life and in my, from the time I was, you know, 12, 13 years old and I was in that office till uh, maybe what was it 2005 or when I retired, I always had an objective. I always had a, I, I trained all the time. It was, it was, that's what I did. You know, I, I, I didn't go to parties. I, it's rare that you would get me to go anywhere because I, I never wanted to be subjugated to staying up late or being in, you know, territories where I, I would be uncomfortable, whether around smoking or drinking, or I just wasn't, not that I was antisocial, I just had more, you know, objective of being uh, me. I needed to be me and, and be, uh, you know, very accurate to what, how I wanted to display myself in my career and my fighting. And um, so when we look at today, I think, I think today is more a question of you know, uh, my life. Whereas before it was a question of my career. Mm. Today is more of a question of my life and longevity and how I want to, you know, um, you know, live out the, you know, the remaining years of my, uh, of my life, the quality of life that I like to have. The, un the other part of that is I just don't know how to train like medium. Mm. <laughs> There's no medium speed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, um, Nick was talking about, you know, arthritis, you know, we all have a little bit of arthritis. So sometimes it acts up and, uh, you know, I got to remember that, uh, you know, I'm not uh, 40 years old anymore. Mm -hmm. You notice I didn't say 28, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Wow. Uh I kind of feel like God speaks to us, speaks to me anyways, every day. So um, I don't, I don't really, um, I don't, my dog is snoring. <laughs> <laughs> I got a cat next to me scratching shit, so I get it. I don't really, I, I you know, again, I was just, we was just, because we're going through some trying times with my mom, uh, my mother-in-law. And, uh, you know, um, in the last uh, couple of years, people very close to me have, have passed away. Grandmaster Lee has passed away. My uh, mentor and teacher, uh, Ray Nickell, has passed away. My dad has passed away. And my father has passed away. And so, you know, and my, my, my mother-in-law, she's... Um, again, has Alzheimer's and she's in the late stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. So she's in that, you know, um, um, not anytime soon, I hope, but, you know, she's in that passing stage. So it's, it's a reflective time where, um, you know, our mortality is, uh, is uh, thought about quite, uh, quite often. And so it's, it's not a unfrequent question that you're asking because I do think about the, uh, spirituality and God and uh, you know the, the meaning of life if you, if you have it but um, I do think that um, you know to say you know well what what if I if there were a God and I went to heaven would kind of uh, you know um, contradict what I believe and what I believe is he's here with us always and it's a part of our life it's part of my life and he's a part of my life so I talk to him often and I feel in life's, uh, you know, um, uh, attributes and those things that pass us in life. You know, um, I just wrote about this the other day. You know, I sat, I, I sat and I looked at heaven and I was in a depressive state and I asked, you know, uh, God, I, I need you. And, uh, you know, just then, uh, you know, some kids pass by and, you know, you're looking out the window, they're playing and, and they just walk by and, uh, and I didn't see it. And, uh, you know, 
a little further on, the, the birds start to, from all different colors, start to, you know, go into the tree and they're singing and they're, you know, they're gallivanting and I didn't hear it. And, uh, you know, just then my, uh, my mom would call, you know, she would remind me, we'd have our conversations of all the silly little things I used to say. And as a child, and we, you know, we'd laugh and reminisce. And then, you know, you, you go a little further and then all types of friends and family would call and, you know, we'd reminisce about time and about, and about uh, where, we, where we are in life and our journey. And then all of a sudden I would realize that uh, what was I so stressed out about, you know? So I think, you know, in, if you would allow it that, um, you know, God is quite present, uh, present in our lives all the time. We just have to be able to see it and hear it and feel Thanks it. Thanks for that. And by the way, my mom passed of dementia. And if you or your wife need a friend to chat with randomly, just please reach out because it's a very specific thing. So, you know, I'm sure. sending my love that way. Um, I just, just, just so, so my, we talked a little bit earlier. So my wife, uh, you know, she wrote a book about her mom, it's her memoirs, it's called Dancing with Belle. And uh, she spoke, spent quite a bit of time on it. And uh, I'm extremely proud of her in her, you know, her pursuit of having the book published before uh, our mom passed away. And uh, her mom was able to actually, you know, see it and realize that it was, it was her on the, uh, on the cover. And um, she, um, she was, uh, you know, quite emotional about it and um, I think that it was a great gift and even that is a is a is a is an answer you know where you know you have my wife and I we talk about it quite often and I and I and I kind of liken it to make mom who's in a home but they really are helping her mom to pass you know mm -hmm. they're they're uh, and, and and in that respect it's a gift. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for her mom to not feel, uh, you know, neglected or left alone, or uh, you know, to pass away on her own. And even if she can't remember who she is, she remembers that she loves this person, and she feels the essence of love for that person. And that's, you know, that's a gift. And I would say, like, you know, that's a gift uh, if you can recognize it. That uh, God allows you know, them the opportunity to say goodbye to each other uh, in, especially in this time where, you know, a lot of families don't have the opportunity to say goodbye to loved ones that are, that are passing away. Yeah. And um, that's, that's huge. That it. That's huge. Um, do you have a favorite film and TV martial artist? <laughs> TV martial artist. Do I? She's, she's going like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amanda from the Green Garden. What? The Green Garden. Green Hornet. I don't know what she said. Something about the Green Hornet, but it, it doesn't register with me, Green Hornet. So. Right on. Yeah. Um, um, I, 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 uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, when you were growing up, there was, you know, Bruce Lee was the, was the martial arts action hero. You know, you have a lot of films and I don't really watch a lot of films. I do, um, I am friends with um, um, Michael J. White. I mean, we're not um, um, bosom buddies, but we are uh, definitely martial arts friends. And um, I, you know, I can respect his uh, body of work and um, and uh, he's a really uh, down to earth, stable, stable man. And uh, awesome. And I can appreciate uh, you know his contributions to the to the uh, martial art uh, cinema and world. And um, I have a lot of again friends in the in the states that uh, are with um, in movies. Uh, um, I don't think Bill Wallace does them anymore, but we're. I'm like his little brother that he just seems to torment whenever we're together. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, I love him, and uh, you know, I hope the feeling is mutual. So right on. I, I've met a you know quite a quite a you know um, fascinating group of men in my uh, 
even in my associations here with, uh, again, John Terrien and uh, Jean Terrio and uh, Cesar Burkowski and, and um, Wally Slokey and, you know, the members of that, uh, of our Montreal elite, you know, and um, I have a good friend who I terrorize is uh, Greg Pollock. <laughs> He's our little brother who just, uh, but anyways, we wouldn't ter I wouldn't terrorize him if I didn't love him. And, uh, you know, he's a great guy too. So we have, uh, and, and some others that if I'm not mentioning, you, you know that I, I definitely am thinking about you. So is there um, any one martial artist past or present any time in history who, if you could train with, spar with, fight with for one hour, who would it be? I'm not a good sparring partner. <laughs> I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I'm not a good sparring partner. I, I had a sparring partner and um, he's actually, he was actually and is actually uh, my, one of my closest friends and longest, long living, long, long life friends. He's the, uh, he's the second godfather of my uh, first, <laughs> second child. And I had two for my second child because they were both my best friends and I couldn't, I couldn't make one of them godfather. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, his name is Jersey Long. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, he was very um, dominant also. He was a middleweight in Taekwondo and, uh, and in kickboxing. And um, we were training partners and really inseparable. And uh, I think that uh, as training partners go, I don't think that uh, I would have wanted to train with anybody else uh, other than him. And he was a, he was a great uh, contribution to my, uh, my anger sometimes. Mm. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, very talented man and uh, world champion in his own right. And um, someone that, uh, whose fighting uh, style and skill was, uh, you know, only matched by a few in his life. And, um, he um, he stands out as, as one of the Canada's great uh, greats as well. That's awesome. Thanks. And Paul Dupree, I hope you heard that because he did have a question that I had queued up for after this about uh, Jersey Long. So that's awesome that you touched on him. If everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what would it be? These are deep questions. That's not like, I'm going to take an hour to answer this question. Uh, well, you got about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, repeat that again. Sorry, sorry. Well, what's the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts that you wish everyone on the planet could enjoy? Uh, it's not as hard as I thought. I would say um, my humanity. I think that uh, someone once asked me to like, uh, how would I want to be remembered? And uh, besides being a, a great fighter and uh, the successes in my career, and I and I and I said to them, which is a, kind of the same answer, I would like to be remembered for my humanity, the person that I am and have become over the years, and my awareness of, you know, my responsibility with the talent and with the successes I have, and it's a, it's it's a it's a saying, and it's a. I, Sometimes cliche is, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that um, not just the power that we get from training and, uh, you know, gives us that self-confidence and reassurance, but we also have, uh, you know, our responsibilities as society in, a, in large to, um, you know, uh, show those qualities in life. You know, I don't have a halo. I don't have a, you know, I, I've made mistakes like every man has, has made, but I do feel that um, it's helped me to realize and stay in touch with, uh, with uh, my humanity. Greatest achievement, greatest regret. Ooh. Well, I guess um, <laughs> my wife is raising her hands like this, so. <laughs> I guess that would be greatest achievement. No, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, guys. There's some, there's some politics going on. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> the greatest achievement. No, so I mean, obviously, my greatest achievement, which had achievements on the way, uh, which would be, um, you know, my successes up to, would be winning 
the uh, the world uh, the game world games won and becoming and having that dream be realized becoming a, a world champion in taekwondo mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it 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 accentuated you know uh, a life's journey to that point to um, you know to to for it to be fulfilled and to fulfill that that part of my destiny but it also at the same time it's quite quite strange made me realize that this was not going to be enough and this was not going to be the only success it was going to be the first and i i would not be able to just do it once i'd want to do it uh, quite often quite quite many more times um so i would say my my greatest achievement would have would be to uh, to have won the that championship that world championship world title in uh, the world games um that's not to say you know like um you know um other things haven't been monumental in my life but as far as my career and i think what um established a belief system in myself and uh you know a direction in my life that was the more the most uh, influential thing that happened to me at the time in life that it that i needed it to happen and um was, you know, we're talking about two different things. So we're talking yeah. about career. That's, you know, probably the, the monumental thing, you know, and the, the, the dis most disappointing thing would be after going through Taekwondo and then back to uh, and then to kickboxing and then back to Taekwondo, I wanted to go to the Olympics. Like mm -hmm. I really wanted to go to the Olympics more than anything, you know, and the Olympic, the, that, that journey, you know, from uh, 1995 to, 96 to 2004 was really a, a serendipitous journey you know it turned out to be where you know the uh, the pursuit of that that dream and that goal um, turned out to be more significant than actually obtaining that goal you know which would have been really a, a great a great um, you know crowning achievement let's say of, of already my career and um there were so many things uh, riding against me being able to do it that it just drove me even harder and harder and harder. And so, the more things that uh, stood in my way, the more the more you know I challenged. I took the challenge to win, to try to win, and to try to do my to my best to make it to the Olympics. You know, I never like to go back and say like uh, you know why, who, whose fault. It didn't happen for whatever reasons it didn't happen, but the journey was quite reward, re rewarding. And um, the experience of it adds to the legacy of my, uh, of my career and uh, my, who I am as a, as, a, as a martial artist in my time, in my, in my era. And, um, but the, the, the most probably career-wise disappointment in Taekwondo would be going to the Olympics. The other one would be not getting a rematch with Dennis Alexio, who, uh, you know, he's a great fighter, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the best of his time, absolutely one of the best of his time. And, you know, we all, or we're not, you know, we all have this uh, persona that we display <clears throat> on, uh, you know, who we want to be, how we want to be seen and, you know, uh, in our fight game and, but, uh, you know, with me, uh, outside the ring, uh, he he has always been, um, you know, very respectful and very, um, you know, um, again, it's like we're competitors, but, you know, when we met again, we met again in 2001 in Hawaii, and uh, that, that meeting was, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, like a movie kind of thing. We embraced and hugged and, uh, you know, it was, it was very, you know, touching for our moment. And, um, you know, it shows the mutual respect that we have for each other. So my maybe disappointment would have been that um, I should have really learned uh, what the, uh, what the, what the uh, outcome of high altitude is. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not very pleasant. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and we fought in Lake Tahoe and, uh, you know, the body having no more oxygen is not a good feeling at all. Ooh, yeah. Uh, you, did, you did knock him on his ass, though, which you not many people can claim. 
Well, he's a, you know, again, he's a really uh, extraordinary fighter. He's a great fighter. And, um, and I would have loved to have the opportunity to, uh, to fight him again and in a more favorable uh, altitude would have been, uh, would have been uh, a challenging outcome, I think. And who knows? Maybe something can happen. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd put my money on you, champ. That's who I'd be betting on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks for that. Thanks for those 10 questions. Listen, I lied. And this is my least favorite part of the show is that, you know, the depth and perspective you brought to those answers. And I, and I mean that so genuinely, um, we're out of time. I'm afraid we're out of time. This always flies by. Um, cause I want to keep chatting with you and, uh, we're, we're over time. And as always, you know, our guests are, our, our, our viewers are still with us. Nobody is left. And, and that's a testament to you and, and your, your, your thoughtfulness but what we do like to finish the show on is we go around the horn we each chip in a little on our experience chatting with you and then we give you the last word uh before we take it home with a bit of housekeeping so um Hanchi legacy you want to chip in at all well it was great to hear your story yeah it was good um i would not want to stand in front of you in the ring <laughs> um but i, I like your um your attitude that karate is karate and you are you and you you like to separate that because you, you are what makes karate right the individual makes karate i like your philosophy on that and i really hope we can meet in the near future again be great. okay thank yeah. you for coming thank you for having me thank you for your uh, insight thanks hanji sensei suino i'm sorry i didn't get to the thought i wanted to to link you guys on um but what, what do you want to go with now? Well, I have a lot of things I'd like to say, but uh, in the interest of getting things wrapped up so some of us can curl up and and uh, get some sleep, I'm going to say five things. And the first one is going to be about one woman in your life. And the last one is going to be about another woman in your life. So um, I'm a, a, a bit of a fan of jazz singers. And so it was a wonderful shock to hear your mother's name and realize that she's connected with you. I've heard her sing, uh, not in person, but uh, in recordings quite a few times. So that was, that was really cool. And it's a great example that she said about going off for her career. Um, my mother did the same thing, went to New York City for a graphics career. And although she didn't rise to great heights, my sister followed her and my sister ended up having a, having a, a monumental career because of the example set. So I think there's something to that idea. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing the story. Um, number two is uh, I just love, love, love to see somebody who is a reflective person with a fighter's history. Mm. Uh, uh, that's, that's the pure gold that we get on this show, and we're so lucky to have you. Number three, not so common these days, the thought when you're a child, you think like a child. When you're an adult, you think like a man. Uh, and, and thank you for not only saying that, but be, being the living example of it. You said something I've never heard say quite this way, said quite this way. Number four is uh, you trusted the definition of those words, modest and respectful. And I think that means you lived into them, but I've just never heard anybody say it quite that way. Uh, and then number five, uh, as somebody who's written and published many books, there is nothing quite so significant as someone who purchases one of your books despite all the raves. And so I've already ordered the book on Amazon and it's gonna be at my house uh, by Tuesday. And so thank you so much for putting that in front of me and I'll read it and uh, tell your wife, God bless. Thank you so much for making that thing happen. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Thank very you. Insightful. Thank you. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dauphin? Man, the champ, two words I would say, very genuine, very deep. Totally genuine person, very deep person. Uh, going back to the beginning, yet another martial artist. The YMCA should be credited for so many great martial artists oh, and the beginning of so many great martial artists. Uh -huh. It's really crazy when you think about it. If you uh -huh. go back and look at all these interviews, so many people started at the YMCA. Um, I like when he said he wasn't serious about anything when he was 11. I, I like that. <laughs> right? like, that's awesome. Right. Um, I like his early memories of his instructor when he said, do what I tell you, train and compete. He obviously did what he was told and he trained and he competed. Right? That's, that's clear to me. 
I enjoyed that you're a fan of Elvis. My dad was a fan of Elvis and my karate teacher is a fan of Elvis, right? So, uh, I, you know, I really relate to first in, train hard, last out. I fucking love that. Like that's like a mantra that you should live your life by. Cause then when you stand across the ring and you look at somebody, you know, that they might beat you on something but it wasn't training harder than you and it wasn't putting more time in. So um, I also liked when you talked about when you weren't in the gym, you were just fighting in your head all the time. <laughs> that's something I've heard Sense of Legacy say like a million times. Yeah. Like, when I wasn't in the dojo, I was fighting in my head, right? And I do that too. Um, I really like what you said about your mom sacrificing to give you a future. That's uh, awesome that you can recognize that. Um, like Sense of Sfino, when you're a child, you think like a child. And when you're an adult, you think like a man. That's in retrospect, that comes very clear. Um, you made the statement, I was a driven soul. And I think you're still a driven soul, champ. I don't think that's changed. You were and you are. Um, one thing that really came through to me is just your love of the history and the fact that we are standing on the shoulders of other people. You echoed that through your talk all the time, but not only that we are, but that you've thought about it and that you try and carry that forward and you try and that's awesome. I, I wish all martial artists would continue to do that. Um, obviously I already jumped on it, but uh, you show what you expect people to show you, right? Like that's that, I think that's true. Um, I like when you talked about the, I never thought about it this way, but I'm going to think about it a lot, but the true grit of the first generation of martial artists, that's a really deep and good statement for martial artists today to think about, right? Is that true grit of having to hunt everything down and battle for every single thing. And then we just get it right. So mm -hmm. I, I loved hearing that. Um, uh, you know, that inspiration of where you've come from, uh, you became something that you believe. Uh, this is really good. The man teaching me believes it and has taught me to believe it too. That's like, they believe that in you and they taught you to believe it in yourself. That's so true. I, I love that. Um, I like when you talk about your imagination and training, it comes clear that you have a and since Legacy has always said, the greatest gift you'll have as a martial artist is your imagination to envision these things. And um, you said stuff about other guys being more flexible, more grittier and more stronger than you. I can't imagine who those people are. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> it was really nice to hear you talk about Dennis Alexio because to be honest with you, until we had this interview, I was kind of pissed off at his comments after you fought him in the ring i didn't think they were very nice but i think you say the persona of a fighter and yeah, yeah that's good and it's nice to picture you and he embracing after on the beach in hawaii that's yeah. something that, i that stuff I, is really that stuff is really you know what you're saying in front of the cameras and i don't want to cut you off but what you're saying in front of the cameras and but there is you know there is the human part about it and uh I don't want to cut you off. Just go. No, that's okay, champ. It's your it's your show, right? Um, I liked what you said that the next five years for you is about the quality of your life. That the beginning was about your competitive career, and now it's about your life. That's. I really like that you're proud of your wife. I I don't know her, but I hope to meet her. And uh, it seems like you guys are a great team and a great pair. Um, and I'm gonna order that book as well. I'll be mm -hmm. ordering that, and I hope I can meet her and get an autograph from her in in that book. Um, it's awesome. Uh, I like when you said how you want to be remembered is for your humanity and who you've become. And one thing I'll say, Champ, is you know, I started out uh, just admiring your your physicality and your ring prowess. And I said this also about Jean Yves Terrio. Um, I'm happy that to learn all this about you, and I really admire you a lot more now. Like I admire you a lot more now for a lot better reasons than just being a great fighter. You're a great human being. And I really, really hope, well, that's a great thing too, is I know I'm going to get the chance to see you again. Like I know our paths are going to cross and I can't wait. I'm so excited for it. So I'm thanks sure. so much for coming on here tonight. Learn so much. Thank thanks. you. And thank you very much for reaching out and having me on. And uh, I really appreciate the, uh, 
the sentiments and the uh, you know the uh, the depth of your uh, observation of me as a as a guest. And uh, for sure, I'm sure we're going to meet and uh, and um, maybe have me back on the show. I don't know how much more I could say, but uh, oh. come back on again. Mm -hmm. We got I got already so many messages yeah. and you got to have this guy back on again. Look, <laughs> my phone's been going off through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Good. That's good. Um, thanks for that sense my of goal, fan. Um, Yeah, one thing I just want to remark on, because, you know, I tend to listen more to what my teachers get from the chats and take a lot of this as a lesson. But the big thing for me is, you know, a lot of even the ways you answered the 10 questions or the way you shared your own perspectives, uh, even when asked by Hanchi Legacy on the martial arts, so many times, and I don't mean our guests as much as the martial artists I meet around the, the dojos, they'll say their ideas and they're parroting their teacher's ideas or they're trying on for size the higher ranks ideas. And I get that, it's part of our path on this thing. But the one thing I love so much is every idea you're sharing is your idea that you've discovered through your journey, including, as I mentioned at the opening, where your own rubber met the road in the ring. And I love that. I love that. I mean, I personally, I'll try ideas on for size and see if I can eventually own them or not. But I'm hearing a man who owns every thought he has because of the path he's walked to figure out what those answers are. And I just want to say how much I appreciate that. Um, we're, I'm going to throw it to you before I'll come back to myself and Sensei Dofan to take us out. Uh, is there anything you want to say to the, to the watchers before we go? Uh, you know, I think this is a, an awesome, awesome uh, show. And uh, I think, as I said, when I first heard about it, I thought it was a, a really great contribution for, um, you know, uh, martial artists to uh, actually be heard and, and you know, seen and, um, you know, learn a little bit more about what they are as, as actual people. You know, people see us as, uh, you know, fighters and, uh, you know, they have their expectation. And I have come across many people doesn't matter what I say to them, they just want to see this aspect and they want to know that aspect. And this form and this show and you as guest, as host, you know, um, allow people like me to be able to come out and, you know, say who we are and what we mm. feel and what, we, what we've learned and, uh, you know, through our passions of life and passions of the martial arts. And I can't thank you enough for um, having me on and have, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to really, uh, you know, meet uh, yourselves and uh, your audience, and um, hopefully become a part of, uh, you know, uh, their lives and their perspective on uh, who I am and what what my contributions might be to uh, martial arts. Such a pleasure! Thanks. Such a pleasure! Um, I just want everyone to know that uh, this is Don Warner from Warner Entertainment, W A R R E N E R Entertainment. We're proud to be one of the sponsors of Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. And we encourage you to visit our website at warnerentertainment.com. Get your free copy of Warriors Magazine today. Over 2,500 items, including books, DVDs, downloads, rare posters, lots more, featuring some of the biggest names in the martial arts, Shotokan's Hirokazu Kanazawa, Goju Ryu's Chuck Merriman, Ninja Stephen Hayes, legendary Joe Lewis. That's just the beginning. That's warnerentertainment.com, W-A-R-R-E-N-E-R. -E -E Thanks for listening and keep smiling. Sensei Dofa, I'm going to throw it your way. Let us know about next week. Add the thoughts on the ad, as you always like to. What do you got for us? Yeah, on the ad, I guess what I would say is, um, you know, Mr. Warner, he doesn't like it when people call him Sensei, or he doesn't like it when I call him Sensei, but that's what he is. And there's people on this call <laughs> and lots of people who he's responsible. He's a pioneer in North American martial arts as well. Like, he's... And so I really am happy to be connected with him uh, and that we are connected with him in this way. Um, and I really hope that one time we can have him on here. He says no, but I would really like to be able to talk to, to Don Warner on this, uh, this show. Next, week, next Thursday, super excited. First time we're ever going to have uh, two guests on simultaneous. And we're going to have Hanchi Terrian on and Hanchi Burkowski all together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to have Hanchi Legacy. And these are like three people who go back 50 years together, mm -hmm. right? Like they've been connected to each other for 50 years. And uh, I think we're going to get a true flavor of what it's like uh, to kind of just sit around a table and listen to people talk. And I'm excited because your personality comes out when you're around your friends, right? Like when you're around 
to some of your five closest friends. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to see who, who you're really like. And uh, I <laughs> can't great, wait. To, great I, what's that, said, uh, Champ? You're, you're two great men. Really, really have a, you have a wealth of you know history and those two those two men for sure, absolutely. I agree. Uh, I've known uh, I've known Hanchi Burkowski. Uh, the first time I met him was at my very first tournament when I was a yellow belt. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know Hanchi Terry and then, but I've really gotten to know him over the last couple of years, and I'm really grateful to have gotten to know him. They've yeah. both really supported this show and helped us a lot, and I can't wait to be talking to them next week. Exceptional, They're exceptional men. I'm really uh, you know honored to be uh, called friend and brother to them. I called I called John Big Brother, <laughs> so yeah. He he said uh, we probably can't get into it. We'll get into the next time you can think about your answer. But Hanchitarian sent me a question and said, "Ask my little brother about what I used to say about his spinning kicks all the time." That's yeah. what said. So <laughs> let's just don't answer that, please. Okay. Let's just leave, leave be that as a teaser for the next time. <laughs> It's the, re it's the reverse of the round cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that, everybody. Thanks, Sensei Dofan, for letting us know. I can't wait for next week. I mean, that's going to make my job so easy. I'm going to just sit back and, and, and guide as little as I need to. And thank you, everybody, for watching. It means the world to us. We can't wait to see you online next week. Please be safe. Life is what it is. Uh, and, and, and make your way here next week safely, happily, and uh, put in some training from now till then. All the best, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thank you.